funding for education. I am very proud to say that finally, in 2019, we have been able to pass a transformational and sustainable investment into our education system with the signing of House Bill 3427. The Student Success Act marks a turning point for education in Oregon. We can finally invest in an education system that will ensure every single student in our state is on a path to realizing their dreams for the future. What we have come together to do over the past few months will be felt by students, teachers, and schools for years to come. Thank you to the legislature, obviously the co-chairs of the Student Success Committee, and the chairs of the uh, Revenue Committee for getting this done. But I have to say that wasn't all. Since the 1990s, I've been working on meaningful campaign finance reform. Now, after Oregonians vote in November, 2020, we'll be able to ensure that no one, no one can buy a megaphone so loud that it drowns out all the other voices. But again, we didn't stop there. In 1991, as an advocate for the Women's Rights Coalition, I first began working on family medical leave. When Governor Barbara Roberts passed that legislation, signed it into law, Oregon became one of the first states in the entire country to ensure that parents could stay home with their children without fear of losing their jobs. The unfortunate and harsh reality is that legislation wasn't meaningful for many struggling families throughout the state without a paid option. Now, in 2019, we have been able to pass 2005, House Bill 2005, that will ensure families across the state can stay home with their uh, sick kids and not have to worry about whether they can pay the rent or the mortgage. So I'm very, very pleased that we were able to get that done. Who's ever on the phone? Can you mute? <laughs> Thank you. But one thing that has changed every year since I first started working in the Capitol uh, over uh, 25 years ago is the cost of housing in Oregon. Dan and I bought our second home in Southeast Portland in the late 1990s. Now, the truth is, if that we were buying our first home today, there's absolutely no way we could afford it. But after the progress we've made this session on addressing the housing crisis, we will ensure that Oregon is moving to be more affordable for everyone. I'm so pleased with the significant investments that we made, uh, both to ensure that everyone has a warm, safe, dry place to call home, and that we can prevent rent gouging in communities throughout the state. Oregon has long been a leader in health care access with virtually every adult covered, either through employer-sponsored insurance, individually purchased coverage, or under the Oregon Health Plan. However, to maintain that coverage and to continue to improve health access across the state, we need a sustainable funding source. I stand before you today and say we have made the progress we needed to make to prevent families from living in fear that their health care will be ripped away from them. I am so pleased for the work that was done over the last couple of weeks on House Bill 2270, and I want to say thank you to the many folks. This was truly a team effort. In total, this has been truly an extraordinary session in terms of making Oregon a place where everyone can thrive. I don't remember a legislative session where we have made this much progress. I'm really proud of what we did and how we did it, collaboratively across the aisle and around the state. That's the Oregon way. But I think we can agree that the Oregon way was not on display the last couple of weeks. And now we are left with one major piece of unfinished, unfinished business. My colleagues in the legislature and I were elected by Oregonians with a clear mandate to address the challenge of climate change. If that isn't clear to everyone, just ask the young people who stood in the Senate chamber throughout the session and pleaded for their future, for themselves and for their children. I will continue to fight for their futures. We must pass a cap and invest program that will achieve the state's greenhouse gas reduction goals at the least possible cost while continuing to grow our economy. 
This is an issue that impacts our economies, our communities, and our people across the entire state of Oregon. No matter what political party you affiliate with, we can all agree that this is an issue that will ripple from generation to generation if we do not work together and do our part to make sure that Oregon meets this challenge. Let me be very, very clear. I am not backing down. There was a lot of hard work over the last couple of years since I first announced a cap and invest as a priority legislation. Good work and frankly, many changes based on constructive industry feedback went into House Bill 2020. Some are saying that a bill with over 100 amendments is a flawed product. I say it's a sign of a collaborative process and a very good bill. So today, I'm asking every Oregonian, particularly those who've been in the Capitol for the last few weeks, to work with us to find a path together to create clean energy jobs across the state. As you all know, I've traveled Oregon extensively to learn more about how climate change is impacting our communities around the state. I've also been listening to those communities to learn how a cap and invest system would impact jobs and industry. Over the next few months, I'm gonna redouble my efforts with impacted industries and communities to ensure that we truly understand their concerns. Specifically, I am directing the Carbon Policy Office to work with rural manufacturers to analyze the cost and competitiveness of their industries. We need to know how we can sustain these important jobs this sector provides while meeting our carbon reduction goals. Second, I'm also directing my staff to meet with transportation interests to discuss reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector and further incentivize uh, the transition to lower emitting vehicles under a cap and invest system. My goal for the next few months is to present proposed modifications to the legislation that still achieves the state's greenhouse gas reduction goals at the least possible cost while continuing to grow our economy. We know that economic growth and addressing climate changes are not mutually exclusive goals. Oregonians have elected us to find a path forward to achieving both of those goals. To be clear, working on legislation is my preferred approach, collaborating across the aisle and around the state. However, given the uncertainty that now permeates Oregon's political system, I am also directing my staff and agencies to explore alternative paths in case these collaborative approaches do not lead to successful legislation. This includes the use of my executive powers and direction of state agencies. The stakes are incredibly high. We are in fire season. Increasing threats from insects and disease threatens our forests. Fruit trees and grapes are suffering in increasingly warm winters. Ocean acidification threatens our most valuable fisheries. And a declining snowpack our valuable outdoor recreational industries. I have had an open door policy since the discussion began. I will continue to listen to any concerns brought by Oregonians. But make no mistake, doing nothing to reduce emissions is not an option. Not for our economy, our, our communities, our environment, and of course, particularly our children. I am open to modifications, but I am not open to inaction. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. When you say um, agency, you talk about, uh, would you look at having DEQ changed emissions regulations to go at it that way? Or? Look, at this point, all options are on the table. As I said, my first preference is to work collaboratively with the legislature to come up with a solution. If that approach isn't viable, then all other options are on the table. We're going to use every single executive tool that we have. 
Will you look to uh, the 2020 session to bring back uh, HB 2020? Timing still unknown. Uh, as I said, my goal is to spend uh, time in communities around the state uh, to work with legislators on both sides of the, of the aisle to make sure that we have uh, a productive legislative path forward. We're still looking at timing at this point. Governor, um, in all the conversations, you're the first person I've heard in the past few days say that you really want to go out and listen to the concerns. Everybody else has been talking about we want to go out and educate them. Is there a communications gap? There. I mean, because you're, you're talking about early. Look, House Bill 2020 got further uh, in this legislature than it has in any other uh, legislative uh, chamber in the country besides California. But I think it's critically important if we're going to move forward successfully that we really listen and hear the concerns of communities around the state. And I'm committed to doing that. Uh, actually, not at all. I think it was critically important uh, that I use uh, the authority that I have invested in me and my office uh, to ensure that Senate Republicans are doing their job. As you know, I called off the police until on Tuesday night. Uh, they did not come back into the building until Saturday morning. I think Oregonians should be asking, what were they doing? between Tuesday and Saturday. Uh, I can't believe that they were on the East Coast and it took them that long to drive back. Uh, you said that you want to listen, sit down with the industry and board members that are concerned about this policy. Uh, you didn't mention that for Senate Republicans. Uh, are, are they being kind of cut out of this path forward given the past couple of weeks? No, I would fully expect uh, that Senate Republicans would be at the table and uh, be a part of this conversation. Do you have concerns I believe that uh, at least some of the Senate Republicans are willing to engage in this conversation. An executive order is kind of a big threat. I mean, not threat per se, but it's a big deal. And usually you kind of take it a bit more, you know, let the legislature do its thing. What's different about this session and what was it about necessarily maybe the walkout that pushed you to explore these other paths? Well, I, I think it's really clear that uh, Senate Republican actions have subver subverted the democratic process and uh, instead of staying at the table and engaging in a productive discussion, uh, they took their marbles and went home. Um, I think it's critically important uh, that we use every single tool that we have in our toolbox uh, to move forward to tackle global climate change, and I'm prepared to do that. But let me be really, really clear. My first preference is to work collaboratively and through the legislative process. Is that why, let's say, you were negotiating with Benz prior to the walkout? and other Republicans, is that why you didn't float an, an executive order to try and keep them from walking out? Look, um, we were in the midst of what we were hoping was going to be a successful passage of House Bill 2020. Um, I was hoping that Senate Republicans were at the table to have a serious negotiation. It was clear from their uh, actions uh, that day that they weren't seriously negotiating. Um, I think that's unfortunate. I know that House Bill 2020 uh, accepted and uh, included uh, suggestions by key Republicans in both houses. I think that work needs to continue. Uh, I think it's incredibly important uh, for Oregon, for our economy, uh, for our communities, and frankly for the health of our people to continue that work in a collaborative manner, and I'm committed to doing that first. Again, if we can't get there through the legislative process, we will leave all options on the table. Do you have a response to the minority, Senate Minority Leader's um, accusation that you threatened him and threatened other Republicans specifically by calling into their districts and threatening to cut out projects? I certainly did call into a couple of the districts. The conversation was this, and that is we can't uh, move this important legislation, uh, House Bill 5050, which was the program change bill, without a quorum of uh, legislators on the floor. 
And so if rural voices want to be heard, rural legislators have to be at the table. What were you hoping to do with those conversations? Uh, make sure that communities knew that they would be impacted if we couldn't get House Bill 5050 passed. Were you hoping that those leaders in those towns and the districts would call their representatives and put pressure on them that way? Uh, yes, absolutely. Show up and do their jobs. We couldn't get those programs funded without Senate Republicans. Should there be uh, consequences for Senator Bolkwist's election? Look, Senator Bolkwist's behavior was unbecoming of an elected official and an embarrassment to the entire state of Oregon. I expect the Senate to hold him accountable. My understanding is the uh, Senate Committee on Conduct is meeting July 8th, and I expect them to take appropriate action. Governor, do you think that Senate Democrats could have done more to whip votes within their own pockets to support House Bill 2020? What do you think about Democratic leadership? Look, um, my goal is to move forward. Um, I think uh, that uh, there was a reason why the Senate Republicans left, uh, and they wouldn't have left uh, if there wasn't the votes on House Bill 2020. So you think there were votes by the Democrats? Then why did Peter Parkin say there weren't? Look, things change over time. All I'm saying is, why would uh, the Republicans left? if House Bill 2020 didn't have the votes. And what I'm saying is, it doesn't matter at this point. We gotta move forward. We gotta do this in a collaborative way to make sure everyone feels like they're being listened to and everybody gets heard. Do you have a preference on getting this resolved uh, in, in a special session or in the short session in February? My preference is to move as quickly as possible and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make that happen. So are we looking for a special session? Probably not tomorrow, but... Uh, Dick, so, uh, it is less than uh, 24 hours since Tiny Die, which I think was about 5.15 yesterday. Um, I think it's too premature to be discussing the particular path forward. I'm committed to listening to Oregonians. I'm committed to working with Republicans. I think we need to get this done, uh, not only for our communities and our economy, but we need to get it done for our children and our children's future. Governor. Why did Oregon struggle to transition from a fossil fuel based economy and system to one using a green energy? Um, obviously, it's, it's been a problem. Some people felt that they would be uh, hurt uh, financially. Well, what does that say in the larger scheme of things as um, the country? You know, is this an example that uh, there are pitfalls ahead for other jur greater jurisdictions as they try to make this transition? I I think this transition is not an easy one. There is no question. But the harsh reality is it's our underserved communities, our rural communities, our low-income communities, our communities of color, and our tribes that are suffering the most uh, through climate change. And our job and our responsibility is to tackle it in such a way that doesn't exacerbate those existing economic disparities. And I'm committing to do that and to make sure that we do that as we move forward in clean energy jobs legislation. Despite 2020, um, how would you characterize the way that the weekend went once it got out of work? <laughs> Look, um, I, I, I think this was a really challenging session on a number of levels, and this weekend was really, really tough. I, I'm so proud. Uh, at the same time of all the work that we were able to get done despite all of those challenges. And I know that Republicans and Democrats came together to make that happen productively uh, over the weekend, and I really appreciate that. Governor, uh, yesterday Senator Burdick floated the idea of looking at the, at the Constitution and changing the quorum rules perhaps to about 50 percent, which is the, kind of the standard nationwide. Um, you've been involved in walkouts, obviously. I'm curious what are your thoughts on that. So uh, the fact that I was involved in walkouts, I wasn't involved in the walkout. It was the House Democrats um, that did the walkout. But um, the times were different then. You might recall that we didn't have uh, a time limit on the legislative session. And so it didn't bring the legislative branch to a halt. And that is different uh, with uh, time-limited legislative sessions. So I, I think the legislature has to look 
the tools available to it uh, to make sure that a small mi minority doesn't subvert the legislative process and essentially set, shut down the legislative branch. I don't think that's access acceptable, and I don't think Oregonians would find that is a good way to do business. So in the forward, what's the solution? Now, look, I think there's a number of solutions. I think it's a really important conversation for the Senate and the House to have. So do you think this might have been one of an unintended consequences of the constitutional change that was made in the early test? I think it is one of the unintended consequences, yes. Governor, you talked about the legislation you like. Are there bills you're looking at? <laughs> Well, yes, yes, yes. I anticipate um, we are doing a thorough review of the legislation coming to my desk. We have 30 days to do that. Um, there are certainly some bills that I know make me grumpy, and we'll be reviewing those. Uh, I don't know when we issue the list. I'm looking. Don't have any of the process people here. We'll get that information to you. Can you mention off the top of your head, are there any <coughs> mind that you really don't like? Uh, I, I certainly want to examine uh, the one impacting the initiative process very closely. And I don't remember the bill number. 761 is it? That might be, yes. So, other than that. It was a very productive legislative session. You basically got everything you wanted except 2020 out of the budget. I, I would say that's pretty damn good. <laughs> talk about to sort of reflect on the executive branch's role in this legislative session. How much arm twisting per se did you have to do to get these priorities sign sealed delivered to you, to your desk? Great question. Uh, I think we set the frame uh, for the legislative session very, very well. As I went back to review my remarks in the State of the State Address, essentially, as you said, we have moved forward on all of these priorities. And certainly on House Bill 2020, tackling climate change, we have moved the ball down the field. Um, I, I, what I was pleased to see, because we didn't have a solid agreement amongst leadership, uh, was the forward progress on uh, democracy reform and the fact that this legislature uh, after I've been working on campaign finance reform for over 20 years was finally able to refer a constitutional amendment and do it in a bipartisan way is incredible I've been fighting for paid postage since I was a little Secretary of State I was really pleased to get that done um, I think there's absolutely more work to do in that arena but I was just blown away that we were able to move forward and make substantial reform uh, this session on those issues. The housing stuff, the speaker and I were pretty much in complete agreement on that work. Um, so uh, we had a lot of conversations about the direction, but I was very, very pleased with the significant investments that were made. And as I said at the beginning, like literally, I ran in 1992 on uh, adequate and stable funding for education, and the fact that this year, this biennium, we were able to make a significant investment is truly extraordinary. And then there were a whole lot of stuff. We hadn't planned on the passage of paid family leave. Um, that was sort of uh, icing on the cake. Um, the criminal justice reforms, um, which honestly I know would not have happened without Senator Winters uh, being here at the outset of the session. Um, Senate Bill 1008, reforms to the juvenile justice arena. Um, that was extraordinary. I know uh, folks have been working on that over 20 years. That would not have happened without Senator Winter's leadership. Hey folks, if we can get a couple more before we move into the conference room. Yeah, if if we could get back to each question too. Anybody on the phone? It's Gary. I can tell by the phone number. Yeah, I'm on the phone. <laughs> Do you have any questions, Gary? Uh, yeah, this is Jeff May. So oh, sorry. Just, okay, sorry. It was a 541 number. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, yeah, I, well, it's the, yeah, it's the conference called Colin. Hey, I wanted to ask you about uh, campaign finance reform. Uh, you know, originally you talked about you had wanted a referral paired with specific limits. So, you know, in essence, voters would know what they were getting uh, if they approved the referral. How do you feel about the fact that the legislature wound up only doing the referral uh, and, you know, put off limits? How do you, what, what led you to support? 
support that in the end? Jeff. And what do you think the legislature should do now in terms of specific limits? I'm absolutely ecstatic they did the referral. I, you can't do the limits without the referral. And uh, honestly, I am, I'm very pleased uh, that we got it done in a collaborative way. So I'm absolutely ecstatic. In terms of the statutory limits, I think that is on the to-do list for February. Um, I, I think the Rayfield bill uh, is a frame, uh, and I think he's open to suggestions and collaboration, and uh, I think it's going to take some more work, but um, I think it's a matter of fine-tuning as opposed to uh, starting over with a whole new approach. Else would you be concerned if the legislature wasn't able to adopt limits in February? I mean, are you worried about the prospect of the referral passing and then it sort of being unclear whether by initiative or whatever that the limits could wind up being adopted? So I, I think this is a chicken or egg thing. Um, isn't that right? Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Um, I, I think the referral is absolutely necessary if we want to get to statutory limits. Um, I think it would be great for the legislature to pass limits in February. Uh, but my recollection is the uh, SJR 18 doesn't start until after the 2020 election cycle. So there would be plenty of time uh, in the 21 session to do that. I think it makes the most sense, and I think there is a commitment in the building to get the statutory limits done in February, and there's plenty of time to make that happen uh, if folks get to work tomorrow. Uh, last question on that. Do you think the limits that were passed by the House uh, were strong enough or, or what? Uh, like I said, I, I think there needs to be some fine-tuning uh, to the Rayfield bill. I don't remember the bill number. Uh, I think there needs to be some conversations uh, about how do we create a level playing field, and uh, I expect those to happen over the next few weeks. Thank you. I, I, I just have to tell you, Jeff Mapes, in my, you know, since 1991 working on this building, in this building, uh, the fact that we were able to get statutory or constitutional limits out is pretty extraordinary. Um, and that uh, the stars align to make it happen, I, I think it's amazing, honestly. I think it's great. Go ahead. What part, if any, do you feel unlimited campaign donations play in what happened at HB 23? Uh, look, um, I, I, I think, uh, I, I don't know, you know, I, you know, I know people can uh, make, connect the dots. I think it's really important that we move forward on that legislation um, and that we do so in a way um, that ensures that rural communities feel that their voices are being heard and we address uh, the concerns raised by uh, manufa the manufacturing sector. And I'm committed to doing that. But do you think that, that the unlimited uh, campaign, campaign contributions? Uh, uh, look, I've been really, really clear. Uh, Oregon is an outlier in terms of campaign finance. We are one of five states with no restrictions whatsoever. I was horrified and appalled by the amount of money uh, I needed to spend in my governor's race. Um, I was horrified uh, by the amount of money we're spending in legislative races. If you compare us to another state like Washington, you will see that significantly more dollars are being spent. I think that needs to change. And with the passage of SJR 18 out of the building and hopefully to the voters, we can move forward and do it in a positive way. Governor, I always ask about rural issues, so let me ask you one final question. What would you say to the, uh, the, the public Oregonians uh, outside the urban areas about how this legislative session has affected them? Look, uh, we worked very hard um, in a number of arenas, both in terms of policy and uh, dollars, uh, to make sure that we were treating rural Oregon equitably. Um, I committed to do that in my budget. I think at least uh, as I review the budgets uh, and the program change bill, uh, there are significant investments in rural Oregon. And I think in terms of policy, uh, legislators on both sides of the aisle tried to address the concerns of rural Oregon and did so in a positive way. So for those of you that will join us for the pen and paper briefing, you can go through this back door here into the governor's conference room. And we'll go ahead and have the line open for those that are on the phone in the room as well. Thanks. Thank Thanks, everybody. Thank you.